Hello, my name is Scott Napoli. I work for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a wildlife technician with the White River Wildlife Area. Today we're going to talk about trail cameras, how to use them, where to put them, and how often you should check them, and a variety of other issues that you might have with trail cameras. Most people use trail cameras for hunting. Um, other people that use trail cameras are wildlife watchers, and some people use them for security reasons. Many of the hunters are using them for scouting their area where they want to hunt to see what animals are there, when they're there, what they're doing, when they're not there, and it's just a good tool to see what kind of animals you have in the area that you want to hunt. Most any sporting goods retailer is going to have a trail cam of some sort. Um, if you go online, you can find many, many options online for different trail cams. Um, anywhere from $40 on up to $600 if you really want to get into it. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what you're looking for when you make that purchase, kind of how you would select a trail camera. The first thing I want to talk about is the flash type. The uh, old cameras have the white flash like your regular camera would have, which is going to spook your animals and also be detected by people. So those are kind of going obsolete. Uh, the new, the newer cameras are going to have infrared, passive infrared, and um, some of them are considered low glow, which is a faint red visible light that will be emitted when it's activated. And then you have your no glow, which is actually black uh, infrared and will not emit any visible light, which is good for not spooking your animal as well as not being detected by people, so it's a little more secure. Uh, we'll talk about megapixels. You'll see cameras that say they're 20 megapixel cameras. It uh, doesn't mean that they're actually going to be 20 megapixel cameras. What they do, and it's more of an advertising gimmick, is they're uh, interpolating the megapixels, so they're interpolated pixels that um, take the megapixel and actually break it up into smaller pieces, which doesn't actually make it a better quality. So most cameras have a native re resolution of four to five megapixels. But I would recommend the best thing you can do, no matter what camera it is and what, what megapixel it says it is, is to actually go and see the pictures either online or if you have a friend that has that camera you're looking for, actually see the pictures that it takes and that'll give you an idea of what quality picture you're actually getting. Because not only the megapixels, but you could have good megapixels and a bad lens. So. Um, it's good to actually see the picture that your camera is going to show or uh, to, to actually see the quality. We're going to talk a little bit about a Bluetooth camera and how you would set that up. Um, we have one right here on this tree that we're going to go check out. Um, I'm going to grab this ladder. You might consider if you're going to hang up a camera up high, these telescopic ladders are kind of nice. And then you can climb up the ladder, set your camera, which we already have one set up there. And this, like I said, this camera is a Bluetooth camera. And so I don't even need that ladder if I want to check it without taking the camera down. I'm going to log into my app, the Hunting Camera Pro. And we're going to turn on the Bluetooth. There's my camera. I'm going to click on that. It's going to connect to my camera. And then I'm going to turn on the Wi-Fi. You don't need cell service to do this. And this camera is on a feed site where we feed elk. And I'm able to see what that camera sees right now when I bring up this app. And then I click on here to see all the pictures that are on this, this camera right now. And we'll pull up a good picture here. A bunch of elk in here. Um, one thing that you need to know about cameras at night. I'm going to download that one. So I click the pictures I want to download. Then I go to local and pull up that picture. Then I can zoom in on it. And there's a bull elk right there at night. So this is a low infrared um, camera, which means at night they're going to be black and white photos, but still be able to see something the no glow or a little less light but you'll still be able to see what it is and then i can delete that picture or any of these pictures from the actual camera itself i can highlight all these right now hit delete and delete them 
but it's a real simple way to do it without having to get into the camera itself and being that this one's up on the tree the reason we have it up higher is so that when there's a group of elk here and I'll see if I can find a picture that's actually we'll see if I can show you a picture of um, this camera being up higher makes it easier to see all of the animals versus if it was down at three or four feet you may see one animal or a several animals blocking a whole bunch of other animals and not be able to see what you really have there I just saw a little group right here we'll look at I think I did download a whole bunch but there's there's a picture of several elk in the feed site there's two bulls three bulls four bulls actually those are all bulls wow there's eight bulls there those are all bulls so it's neat to have it up higher so you can actually see all those bulls whereas if you had it down three or four feet you might not be able to see some of them in the background especially when there's a big herd there so it's just something to think about when you're placing your camera and also for security reasons having it up that high most people are going to try and mess with it when they can't get to it unless they carry a ladder with them one of the most important things to consider when you're buying your trail camera is the trigger speed and the recovery speed so the trigger speed is the time elapsed when your camera first senses motion until it takes the picture and then the recovery speed is the time the camera takes to store the photo and be ready for the next photo and some are really good like trigger speed on some cameras are a quarter of a second and then there's some that are up to two seconds so you might consider that the other thing that um, makes a difference with your trigger speed and recovery speed is actually your range of motion uh, where the detection range and the detection uh, range of your motion so um, we'll talk a little bit about that next your motion sensor and your detection range so the detection range is the distance that's uh, farthest away for an animal to actually trigger your camera and sometimes they'll be most of them are at least 40 feet but some are up to 120 feet and maybe beyond that um, and then your motion sensor is what actually detects the animal coming into the range of your camera and the motion sensor is basically infrared radiation uh, beams that are shot out at a certain angle from your camera they're all equally balanced and, and they determine motion and heat so if there's a change in the balance of those elements that are shining out then um, it'll trigger and then that's when your picture is taken so all those things are variables to consider and we'll talk a little more about um, the detection zone as far as motion goes and the field of view in a little bit all right, let's talk a little bit about actually setting up your camera. So the first thing you want to do is make sure that you have batteries in it, an SD card. Some cameras won't even uh, let you set it up without having an SD card in it. And you'll want to set the date and time. You, most cameras, you can set it to show the date and time on your pictures. Um, you don't have to. You can turn that off, and you'll still be able to access the date and time on your SD card when you look at your pictures. Another thing is um, how many photos do you want it to take at one time? Do you want it to take photos or do you want it to take video? Or do you want it to take both? There's cameras that are set up to um, give you the feature of actually taking a photo and then video. Um, there's also, most cameras do photo bursts, so you can have three pictures taken all at once, um, even all the way up to 10 photos at one time. And some of the things to consider with that is battery usage as well as um, your memory so the more photos you take of course the faster your card fills up but um, those are minimal things to think about um, just so you know it does take uh, less energy so if you took three single photos versus one photo burst of three it's actually less energy uh, used on the batteries taking the photo burst of three um, because the camera has to set up each time before it takes the photo on those single pictures versus it only does it one time to take those photo bursts of three. So it's something to think about. Another thing to think about is the de delay between pictures. So it takes your pictures, you can set a delay of zero seconds to minutes 
if you want it to wait before it takes pictures again, even though there's motion or heat there, it'll wait that long for it to take pictures again. And again, depends on where you have it set up. If it's at a feed site, you may want to delay um, considerable amount so you're having less pictures to, to scroll through when you're checking them. Um, there's also a thing called time lapse on most cameras where you can actually set it up to take pictures a certain time of day or a certain hour or every hour. Um, that's all different scenarios that you can consider uh, depending on what your goal is for taking your trail camera out into the woods. Another thing we'll talk about is uh, a big one. It's the sensitivity of your camera, um, motion detection. They call it the passive infrared and that is what monitors uh, it's it's basically monitoring the amount of infrared in the detection zone of your camera and when it there's a change in that detection zone um, either by motion or heat or both it'll take your picture and so that's uh, there's different zones for different cameras as far as degrees and what you want to know about is um, well, first of all, we'll finish with that is, is talk about how you can adjust that. So you can adjust the sensitivity of your motion detection, basically. And from low to high, some have medium high, some have high, some have just low, medium, high. And so if it's on high, it's going to be more sensitive to any change in that detection zone versus on low, um, where it'll take a little more. Like, for example, if you just want to get pictures of a big animal like a bear or elk, then you can put it on low and because that animal is so much bigger, it's going to detect, be detected in your camera versus if it was a bird, then the bird might not be picked up uh, if it's on low. I generally use my cameras at medium or medium high or high um, for general rule. Um, you. So some of the cameras you can't adjust, most of them you can nowadays, but some you can't actually adjust the uh, passive infrared, so your motion detection uh, sensor. Um, another thing to know is we've talked a little bit about the range of the detection range of your camera. So if it's 120 feet, then the animal 120 feet away is gonna trigger your camera. Um, other things to consider in that case is uh, your motion detection zone which could be 45 degrees or could be 37 degrees. It varies with uh, every camera, but the motion detection zone is different than the field of view. So your animal walks into the motion of detection zone, say it's 45 degrees, that triggers your camera to take the picture, but it doesn't get the picture until the animal's in the field of view zone so if it's 45 degrees for your motion detection and the actual field of view is say 41 that's a pretty good ratio you want to have those two numbers real close together so that you're actually getting the animal in the picture and not leaving the picture because it was so far away from your motion detection zone so those are things to think about um, when you're selecting your camera and setting it up in the field okay let's talk about uh, setting up your camera as far as formatting your SD card um, most cameras require you to actually format your card and the best thing to do is to format it with your actual trail camera. Um, you can format it in a computer but it may not have the same file structure and so it may not work in your camera once you get out there and set it up. So the best rule is to format your SD card with your actual trail camera that you're going to use. Um, another thing that I just want to reiterate is that when you check your pictures, we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, Make sure you don't use your digital camera to be trying to check your pictures because you may not be able to or you might lose them on your SD card. Other thing we'll talk about is batteries. So all the trail cameras out there vary in how many batteries they carry and how long they actually last. Um, some will have four batteries, some will have eight, some will have 12, some might even have more than that. Um, as far as batteries go, um, that's, it's not just the battery, so you want to think about your battery choice, but also how much activity you're going to have on the camera, what the weather is like, um, length of videos maybe that you're choosing to record. All that stuff affects your batteries. And the general rule is, though, not to use alkaline batteries, um, specifically because they don't last long in the colder weather, and um, they just don't hold up as long as lithium batteries. So we recommend lithium or ulti ultimate lithium batteries 
and even rechargeable lithium batteries are great for your trail cameras and they'll last a lot longer um, one thing I would recommend is when you go out in the field to check your cameras actually carry extra batteries with you so that you don't get disappointed when you get to your camera and it's dead or it's really low and it's going to be dead for the next month if you're waiting that long to check them so carry extra batteries I do all the time um, and other options for batteries are uh, they have power packs that you can hook up to some of these cameras you can also get some that are uh, have the ability to be charged by solar and those are kind of options that maybe aren't going to work so well for people using them on public land but in other cases you might be able to consider those as other options for powering your camera and keeping it powered okay let's talk about where you might put your camera there are a lot of options and it depends on what you're looking for as well but you would want to consider as a hunter sign that you see of an animal say tracks scat you might look at scrapes or rubs um, you might also consider waterways along waterways at water holes also um, prey based areas especially in winter time where deer and elk congregate in certain areas um, that's going to be a great prey based area especially for uh, those animals as well as predators depending on what you're looking for another thing to think about is the the height and angle of your camera um, if you're trying to catch big animals like deer and elk general rule is three foot off the ground um, so like on this tree is about three foot up um, and then you want to consider your angle we're standing on a closed road here and this camera is mounted at this angle about a 45 degree angle to the road you wouldn't want to have it over here because an animal walking by on this road is going to go by quick enough that you might not get the picture so this way you're you're getting a better detection zone and able to pick up that animal coming through even if they're moving fast you generally will catch them getting through this area um, we'll talk a little bit about ground slope so if we did have this camera right here and the, the ground slopes down and you had it at the same height you may not get something if you had your camera aimed for out there where the ground slopes down even further you may not catch what you're looking for so you might consider either moving it down or putting an angle on it with a stick behind it like i put these sticks behind here to get an angle on your camera to get that shot another thing to talk about is something that people don't think about is the sun so the last thing you want is the sun blinding your camera when you're getting an animal coming through so a general rule is that you want to place your camera facing north or south and for that reason you just don't want the sun in it for hours at a time during the day another thing to consider is you see this tree it's a pretty good sized tree the general rule for that is you want to have your camera on a tree that's 10 inches in diameter or greater and the reason for that is because you get some of these smaller trees and the wind blows and they'll start swaying and setting your camera off constantly and you'll get pictures of nothing so think about that also um, again if it's winter time and there's snow or the, even if it's not winter time you're setting your camera in the fall but you know it's going to be out there for a couple months you know it snows in this area then you want to consider the depth of the snow uh, if you know what it is and you know, as a general rule um, you know you're going to have to have pretty deep snow here to cover this camera but you also want to consider um, branches that are above your camera when they get snow load on there it's going to sink them down and be in front of your camera in a lot of cases so something to think about looking at the tree itself and the branches above it to make sure that that's not going to happen same with the wind if you have branches that are flimsy and the wind blows they can blow the branch down setting your camera off all the time and the last thing you want is a thousand pictures of a branch in your camera so those are things to think about and then um, as far as uh, we talked about having a feed site where you would have your camera directly perpendicular to the site that you're trying to catch we're in like we talked about here with the road having that degree of an angle 45 degree typically um, same thing with trails you want to do that with trails for the most part um, unless you have a camera that has a really super wide detection zone and you have it far away from the trail where you're going to catch a bigger area then you could put it perpendicular to a trail but general rule you don't do that and the last thing we'll talk about is security this camera here it's got a security case that's locked with a padlock you can get these security cases where you can actually bolt them to the tree and then this is a, a python cable lock that takes a key um, all things that you can do to keep your camera secure especially on private property i mean on public property um, and then we talked about putting the higher up in a tree which is also another form of security it makes it harder for somebody to get to your camera 
Um, I do recommend on cameras that aren't in a security case and that you do have a camera with the ability to lock the door on it. I had a camera that uh, I didn't want to try a cheap camera. I tried a $40 camera from Walmart that didn't have that ability to lock the door on it. And I left it out for five months, went to check it and somebody stole the card out of it. So something to think about. There's these little uh, pad locks and I think I have one in my pocket. There's padlocks that are digital uh, combination locks and there's keyed locks that you can get. There's a lot of them are luggage locks. And so these are great for putting on the side of your door to lock it shut so nobody can actually access it and mess with your camera and change your settings or steal your card or all the above. So there's a variety of ways to check your camera. Some cameras have an actual viewer on the camera. We don't have one here today. But that is one way you could check your, your uh, pictures on your SD card with the viewer that's actually on the camera and some will allow you to delete them too. It's not the most recommended way, um, but that viewer is a good way to actually set up your camera so that you can actually walk in front of it, take a shot, and then go look at it and see if you actually have your camera placed where you want it. So other ways to check your cameras are to actually take the SD card out of the camera when you go to check it. If you get an SD card reader, which I have hooked up to my cell phone, then you can check them right there in the field, pull up your pictures on your cell phone, delete what you don't want, put your card back in the camera and leave. One way I prefer to do it though, is to carry a SD card with extra SD card case with extra SD cards. And then I just go up, open the camera, pull the SD card out. I'll put it in my camera case upside down so I know that's when I want to check when I get home and I'll just look at them on my computer with a bigger screen and be able to see more of what I want to see and that's a quick and easy way to do it. Um, then we have Bluetooth cameras where you just show up with your cell phone you don't actually have to open the camera you can be we have one right next to us right now it's high up in a tree so I'd have to use a ladder to get to it and on a Bluetooth camera I just have an app on my phone open that app and then I can see all the pictures that are on that camera. I can download what I want, delete what I don't want, and then move on. And so that's a great way um, to check your, your pictures on Bluetooth cameras. And then we have cell phone cameras, of course, that uh, send pictures to your phone real time. And that involves, uh, of course, a subscription with a carrier and a data plan, depending on how many pictures you want per month. Next, we're going to talk about how often you should check your camera and what time of day. Um, it's really a personal preference, but you might want to consider several things. One being that uh, depending on where you have your camera, how much activity it's going to get. Um, for example, we're standing at a feed site with a camera on it that's going to have a lot more activity for that reason. So that means you're going to fill your SD card faster and maybe use your batteries up a little more. So you might check it more often, but there are some guys that leave their camera out in a, on a trail for three to six months and then come back and check it. Um, if you're using it for hunting purposes or want to see what's in your area, it's going to depend on what time of year you're actually placing that camera. If uh, you're actually in hunting season, you might not check your camera as often to avoid disturbing those animals and spooking them from the area that you're actually trying to hunt. Another thing to consider is the weather. I already mentioned the activity as far as how many animals might be, for example, at a feed site, but also if it's in the winter time and there's a lot of snow and it's really cold, you might consider that as far as um, battery life and uh, check it a little more often than you know every month. Uh, things to consider are just every time you check your camera, you're leaving scent and disturbing that area. And so you wanna think about that when you're checking your camera. Checking your camera every day is probably not necessary and again would leave a lot of disturbance in the area that you supposedly want to try and hunt. Another thing to consider is not using vehicles such as ATVs to ride up to your camera that you're disturbing those animals every time you ride in and make all that noise. Um, and one thing um, that you'll want to think about is because you have your camera out in a certain area say in the summertime and you have a bunch of animals on it and maybe it's that big bull you've been looking for doesn't mean it's going to be there in the winter time or the fall. So you want to make sure that you're moving cameras around different times of year to see where the animals are actually moving to as well because they will travel. So something to think about.